All right, well, man, here we are. We've been studying the life of Jesus. And if you're kind of brand new checking us out today, let me just tell you how we roll here. We open up the Bible, and we started at the very beginning of the year. We started in the book of Genesis, and we just did one chapter at a time. And we go verse by verse, and we go, what does this say? What does it mean? And then how do you and I need to apply it to our lives? That's the flow of how we, how we teach the Bible here. And my goal is to make sure that when you come to church, that you go, I understand what that passage of Scripture was actually saying. I, I can tell you from experience, many times I've gone to places, and as I was sitting there listening to them teach, they would be up there for a really long time, and I would leave and go, I still don't know what that meant. And I was like confused and lost. And so my goal and my hope and my prayer is that as I break all this down, that you go, I know what that says right there, and I know why God put that in the Bible for me. I understand what it's about. So that's kind of where we're going. I'm going to do a quick review. A couple weeks ago, we started this series, The Life of Jesus, uh, but we didn't just talk about Jesus. There was another character in our story that we talked about. Somebody tell me, what was his name that we studied? John the Baptist. Now, what did John the Baptist do? He baptized people, all right? He baptized people, and he baptized someone really special. Who did he baptize? Did he feel worthy to baptize Jesus? In fact, he said, I'm not worthy to baptize you, Jesus. I'm not even worthy to do what? I shouldn't even be able to carry your sandals around. Like, you're God, and I'm a human. Like, you're Jesus, man. Like, I can't baptize you. And, and Jesus, he said, no, I insist on being baptized, and he was baptized. Why do you think he was baptized? To set an example for us, to say, this is what I want my followers to do. When you pray the prayer and ask God to come into your life and you repent of your sin, that's the, the, the baptism of repentance. You, you're, you're baptized in repentance. You say, okay, I understand my need to submit in that area, and God, I'm coming to you. I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. Thank you for being God, coming back to life three days later again. Thank you for being God in my life. That's the baptism of repentance. But then the second baptism we mentioned was water baptism. And so we watched that happen in between services today. We go under the water, we die to our old life, and we come up as a new creation in Christ Jesus to live for God. That's our testimony. That's our new story. We're going to live for him. So that's water baptism. But then there was a third baptism. What was the third baptism? Somebody. The Holy Spirit. It says after Jesus came up out of the water, what came out of the sky? Some people are saying a dove and some people are saying the Holy Spirit. Good, good, good to, it's the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. It wasn't an actual dove that came down, but it was like a dove. Like a dove descends and lands on something, the Holy Spirit came and descended and landed upon Jesus. And I, I, I brought to you that week, I said, hey, don't forget that maybe if you don't have a lot of the Holy Spirit going on in your life, maybe it's because you've never taken your step to get water baptized. Maybe you've not been repenting of your sin and been, been baptized in the repentance. And so, so when you do that, that allows the Holy Spirit then to come in your life. Now, we see Jesus came on this earth, he gets baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on him, he's on a spiritual high, but then something negative happens. What happens? The devil comes in and tries to do what? Tries to tempt Jesus. How many times did he tempt Jesus? Three times. He tempted him over and over and over again. And, and we saw that, that Jesus actually combated the temptation with what? How did he fight back? He quoted scripture. But we also said this last Sunday. We said, you know, the devil knows scripture. The devil could quote scripture. So he knows the scripture. And if you don't know the scripture, guess what he'll do? He'll change the scripture. He'll distort the scripture. He'll do something to make you believe it's okay to, to do things that are wrong. That's why it's important for you and I to know God's word. Today, as we kind of go back into the life of Jesus and we begin to uh, kind of go over the goal of the message, here's where we go. We want to come to Jesus and have him transform your life and then send you out to help someone else. That's what the goal of the message is today. We're going to see that through the Bible, to come to Jesus and have him transform your life. And by the way, I would argue that most Christians I know are really good at this top part. Praying a prayer, asking God to come in. Okay, I understand Jesus died on a cross. He came back to life. Great. I've come to Jesus, and yes, he started to work in my life. We're good at that. But we're really not great at this bottom half. Then send you out to help somebody else. Most Christians I know are kind of like, it's us four and no more. 
I just want to, it's just, it's just I, I, don't, I don't care if the church gets bigger. I don't care if really people's lives are doing anything. I've got my own struggles. I don't have time to worry about anybody else. I've got my own issues. And what we can become is very selfish Christians. And God has not commanded us to live a lifestyle like that. In fact, it's the exact opposite. So we want to come to Jesus, have him transform your life, and then send you out to help someone else. Let's get into our passage of scripture. We're going to start in verse 12. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. Now, who's John? John the Baptist. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Hmm. Golden message to how Jesus transformed my life and then go out and share it with somebody else and help them. Most people I know just keep it to themselves. And you know why? We, we, we make excuses like this. We go, well, I just, I just don't want anybody to make fun of me. And I'm like, bro, are we like seven years old? Worried about what people think about us? Like, like why are we still there? That shouldn't be us as Christians. We should be people who understand what we have and are excited to share it. Especially in comparison to the fact that if you lived in Jesus' day, and you were John the Baptist proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah, they looked at him and they said, we're going to throw you in prison for proclaiming that Jesus is the Savior of the world. How many people do you know that went to prison for being a follower of Jesus? John the Baptist is like the only one you know of, right? Like, like, like that just doesn't happen the same way right here in America like that. And praise God for that. But as a result of not having anything happen, we kind of don't do anything ourselves either. Like, like, like we don't even fight and contend for the faith of Jesus Christ. And honestly, this is to our shame. This is a problem that we have. We shouldn't be living this way. We, sh we should be out making a difference in the world around us. We should be bringing light into a dark place. Let me give you a good example of this. Um, so a few years back, I had uh, some friends that are part of a church planning organization. I'm going to see them actually this week at a retreat I'm going to. Uh, but the first time I ever met with them, they said, hey, we want to take you to a really nice restaurant. Well, I'm like, dude, Olive Garden is like super nice. I don't know what they're saying. And he goes, no, like, 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 meet me at this time. So we show up, and, and we're walking down to the spot, and he took me to one of those Brazilian steakhouses. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Oh, bro. That'll change your life right there. For those of you who have never been, let me tell you about it, okay? You go there, and you sit down, and it's super fancy. By the way, I'm wearing a pair of shorts and some sandals. I thought we were going to, like, Olive Garden. I had no clue this was, like, fancy night, right? And so, like, I show up, and I'm there, and it's super decked out, and everything's really pretty. And, and the spread they had on the salad bar, it looked amazing. And Amy's eating salad. I'm like, you can't eat salad here. This is a meat place. And she's like, no, it looks so good. So she's eating the vegetables and the fruits and all. I'm like, babe, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my fair share of protein today. And the way they do it is they have these little coasters and one side's red and one side's green. And if you put it on green, they've got 17 or more different, different cuts of meat that come out. Lamb, chicken, bacon-wrapped filet. Hello, somebody. Some of the best meat you've ever seen. Some meat you've never even heard of. And you're like, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll try it. And as long as that thing's green, they don't care how much you grab. Look, they really don't. They just keep bringing it out. And they'll just keep offering it to you and offering it to you and offering it to you. And I eat and I eat and I eat. And I'm like, this is the best restaurant I've ever eaten at in my entire life. And then I grabbed one of the little rolls. Did y'all Did y'all do this? Did y'all see this? In these rolls, I don't know what's in these rolls. I don't know, but I know a little piece of heaven is in the roll. <laughs> it is so incredibly delicious. My mouth is watering right now thinking about the Brazilian steakhouse. I share that with you, and I go, man, when I find something good... And you tell me, hey, have you been to that steakhouse? I go, ah. that steakhouse has nothing in comparison to the Brazilian steakhouse. And then I tell you all about it because I go, I got good news, man. I'm going to feed you the best steak you've ever had in your life. Come experience this because it's good news. Anybody know what the word gospel means? Good news. 
Good news. Good news is when you find something that's incredible, you share it with people. You can't help. You can't keep it to yourself. you got to share it. My friend Cody, I got him finally to come to the Trunk or Treat event. And we were praying for, for my Cody and we've been praying for your Cody's. And guess what Cody told me this past week? He said, hey, I got a family reunion today. He says, I'm not going to be at church. He said, but my parents actually called me Sunday after the event. And just was talking to me and randomly talking about us. And he, he said, I was telling them I was at this church and I did all this stuff. And, and they said, which church is this? And he said, Revolution Church. How'd you find it? And he told them the whole story. And they go, you know, we've been kind of thinking about getting back into church too and looking at something. And so Cody said, well, what if we all just go next week? So next Sunday, Cody's already inviting people to come to church with him. Why? Because when you find something that tastes good, What's the Bible say about Jesus? Taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, you can't help but share it with other people. You can't keep it to yourself. You gotta share it with somebody else. And guys, I'm just, I'm just wondering, I'm gonna be hard on the men in the room today. Men, where you at? Grunt at me, where you at, men? Come on. Yeah, there you are. There you go, still awake. Pulse is still going. Listen, listen, men, I'm waiting for the men in the church to rise up and be who I know you can be. Because let me tell you about something. Men, you all are incredibly gifted people. And I'm not, not, I'm not downplaying the ladies. I'm just talking to men right now. Men, you are incredibly gifted. You are strong. You are able. You're able to do stuff that's incredible. My problem and my contention that I'm seeing is you're building everybody else's kingdom, including your own, instead of working to build God's kingdom. And I'm just wondering when I can count on some men to rise up in the church that I can throw the ball to that can shoot some shots. Because if we look at what we got and we go, wow, this looks really, I like this church. This place is pretty cool. This is built on the back of the ladies. Y'all can celebrate the ladies. Because the truth is the ladies have stepped up. And they've, they've kind of come to the occasion. I'm going, but men, where are the men at? We need more men. Like it's great that the prayer line has all these people, but where are the men at that are going to pray for people? Where are the men? We need some men. It's quiet in the room. You know what that tells me about you guys? Your prayer life isn't where it needs to be. If you're scared to pray for somebody who's hurting and in dire need, you know people that come up to the prayer line are usually going through a lot? Where you're at in your walk with Christ needs to be better than where you're at right today. You gotta get to a place where you can help somebody who's in desperate need. You came to church today and again, you thought it was all about you. And I'm here to tell you that it can't always be all about you. We'll see how many people come back next week after that message. <laughs> but it can't be all about you. When will it not be all about you? At what point does it not become all about you? Because I see people, oh, I grew up in church. Well, you grew up in church. Well, how old are you? I'm 50 years old. Okay, so for pretty much 50 years you've been in and around church. When are you going to plug into the game and actually do something in the game for the kingdom of God? When is it not going to be about you any longer? When are you going to spread the good news? This is what we're called to do. When are you gonna come pray for somebody? Hey, who's the last person you baptized? Whose life are you making a difference in? Who are you mentoring? Who are you pouring yourself into? Which small group are you leading this next semester? Who are you gonna be pouring into? Listen, it's not about knowing the whole Bible and then giving the whole Bible to somebody. It's about taking what you've learned and giving it to somebody else. That's, where, that's, that's Christianity. That's discipleship. That's being light in a dark place. And I go, man, I don't even know what we could do if I could get more men to step up and lead. Where are the men at? And yet God looks down from heaven. You know, there's a scripture that says he looks down from heaven and he looks for a man to lead the way and he couldn't find even one. Men, you're incredibly gifted. You're talented. You're strong, you're able, you're just distracted. And if I can get you to not be distracted with the cares of this world and to focus on the kingdom of God, we'd change the world together. We'd change the world together. Marriages would be totally different. <laughs> Father-child relationships would look totally different. 
the church of the living God would look totally different if I could get some men to be men and to be who God called them to be. So much I want to say. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. All that happened here is Jesus moved and started living in Capernaum. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Remember when I told you in the Old Testament, uh, they had the prophets foretelling that one day a Savior would come into the world? This is now happening. Jesus steps on the scene, and he's moving throughout these different parts. And this is actually prophecy being fulfilled, that he would go to these different places and that a great light would be shown in a dark space. It says, land of Zebulun, this is the prophecy, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. What happened? It was very dark in the region before Jesus stepped in. When Jesus stepped in, he started talking, People go, something's different about that guy. He was a light in a dark place, and they all took notice of it. Imagine this. Everybody see this blue light over here? There's a blue light, a little spotlight just beaming right up at me. If we shut all the lights off right now and only had that light on, we would all have our eye go, it would draw our attention. That's what was happening at this time period. Jesus steps on the scene And it was like a light had shone in a dark place. And everybody went, wow, what is that guy all about? From that time on, Jesus began to preach and he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, now anybody, can somebody tell me, what's the word repent mean? To turn away. It means I was going this way. I was living my life this way. But then I, I repent. I turn away from that behavior and I start doing something different. I repent. And he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Now check this out. These guys are regular fishermen. This is their livelihood. They'd catch fish, and then they would sell the fish to other people to eat, and that's how they made a living. Jesus shows up and sees uh, Andrew and sees his brother and says, hey, put down your nets, your physical nets. Come, follow me. He said, I'm going to show you how to fish for people. I'm going to change your life. Your life is going to be transformed. And once you understand that your life has been transformed, I'm going to send you out to go make a difference in somebody else's life. Come and follow me. If Jesus was to show up today, if it wasn't Pastor Randy up here preaching, and you showed up to church on a Sunday morning, and he was up here, you know what he'd likely preach about? Come, follow me. He'd essentially say, hey, I know you're busy doing all the stuff that you're doing, just like these two brothers were. They were doing their job. I know you're busy at work. I want you to stop what you're doing. I want you to stop all that. Come and follow me. I'm going to send you out to fish for people. We're going to start doing some ministry stuff. At once, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. At once. Now, now at once means they immediately went and gone. Most Christians nowadays aren't like this. Here's what most Christians would probably say if Jesus showed up and said, hey, come follow me. They'd say, well, you know, I'm going to have to like, I'm going to have to like close on my house first. So maybe in like 90 to 120 days, I could come follow you. Most Christians would say something to Jesus like, well, you know, let me pray on that and see if it's what, what I should be doing. That's most Christians today. And, and yet these guys, they just said, this is, this is the light that has come into the world. We need to go follow the light. At once they left their nets and they followed Jesus. This morning I, uh, I came to church and I realized we had baptisms today. So I was going to be getting wet, which uh, was going to happen between, in between second and third service, which is going to make it hard because I'm going to change my clothes and do all that. And then we have child dedication. You saw all those families get up, so I have to figure out all that. And then we had the trunk or treat giveaway stuff, so I'm like, that's new. I got to figure out all that. And I got to preach the message. And then, oh, by the way, you know, I've been up since like 5.15 in the morning. I have seven people in my family. So five kids, we're getting all them together. And we're getting here early because we got to rehearse everything and make sure everything works and the batteries are charged up. We got to do all this stuff to come and do what we're doing. And uh, in addition to that, 
I um, had made a commitment in our children's ministry because today is Can You Juggle Sunday? That's what they're doing in children's ministry. Can you juggle? And I asked for people to help. I'm like, does anybody know how to juggle? A bunch of people knew people, but nobody in, that I knew knew how to juggle. So I was like, well, I know how to juggle, so I'll go ahead and be the one that, that goes and juggles. So I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be a hard day today. I'm going to have to juggle, then I'm going to run in here, and then I'm going to do this, that, and the other. and do. So um, I've got three tennis balls, and I'm juggling, and I'm practicing earlier this morning. And I go to walk out of here. And I, I look at my tech guy back there and I say, Cam, I said, I need to find somebody who can juggle. I need somebody who can juggle. I can't do all these things. I need somebody who can juggle. So I walk out and a guy throws his hand up. He sees I got three tennis balls, he throws his hand up. So I throw one of the balls at him. I said, hey man, do you know how to juggle? And he goes, ah. I said, here, try. And, and he takes these balls and he starts going, his teenage daughter, about 15 years old, looks at him and says, Dad, I didn't know you knew how to juggle. And he goes, tch, 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 tch. I said, Chad, I need a favor, bro. <laughs> he said, what? I said, I'm spread too thin today. I got to be here, there, and everywhere. Can you go juggle in children's ministry today? Which is a big commitment because I'm asking the guy to not just do it in one service. All three services, he's got to go back there and juggle. And you know what I love about Chad? He said, I got you, Pastor. And he's, tch, 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 tch. Teenage girl goes and gets mom and said, Mom, did you know that he knows how to juggle? Mm. I was like, it's like the feeding of the 5,000 at Revolution Church right now. Miracles are happening. People who don't know how to juggle are learning how to juggle in Jesus' name because I need some help, right? I'm glad that Chad didn't look at me and say, you know, Pastor, let me pray on that. You know, he significantly changed my day today because he was willing to step in and serve those children this morning significantly served his pastor this morning. And it made a big difference in my life. That partnership is how we make a bigger impact. At once, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. So we got James and John now. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And say the word, Immediately, they left their boat and, check it out, and they left their father <laughs> and followed Jesus. They're like, Dad, we got to go. Like, where are you going, sons? We got to go follow Jesus. We're going to do ministry stuff. Like, Jesus told us we can go hang with him, and we got to be about the Lord's business. So we're going to go do ministry stuff. I'm sure, Dad, when I visit back here in a few times, I'm going to have some stories to tell you because this guy's incredible. Can't wait to tell you about the journey. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Jesus healed people. Some of you guys, you're like, I don't know what I think about healing. Well, the Bible says Jesus healed people. The Bible says Jesus is the great physician, that he can heal you. <laughs> if you don't know if you like that, you're certainly, there's going to be some people in the room that aren't going to like this next verse right here. They're going to be so bothered by this. Look at this. It says, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan, large crowds followed Jesus. You know, some people... Well, Pastor, that was a cool event you guys did last week, but it's just, just too many people. And I'm like, too many people? They're like, yeah, and the, the building got completely tore up, and uh, there's a hole in the wall back there, and uh, the carpets were stained up, and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, I know, it was awesome, wasn't it? Like, that's just a lot of people. And my heart began to break in that moment. And I'm, I'm going to be hard on us this morning because we have this uh, Americanized Christianity that's so not healthy for us. Americanized Christianity looks like this. How does the church serve me? How does the church make it comfortable for me? How do I make sure that it meets all my needs? I'm not worried about everybody else. What's in it for me? That's Americanized Christianity. Americanized Christianity says things like, ah, the church is just too big. 
Guys, listen to me. And I, I've been guilty of that. You've probably been guilty of saying things like that. We need to repent of that. You know why we should repent of that? Because we've made it about us. Number two reason we should repent, this was the entire mission that Jesus left us with, to go reach people. And as soon as a church stops reaching lost people, it ceases to be a church. At that point, it has become a club of people who are just friends with each other and want to hang out, and it becomes the us for no more mentality. And that's not what God has called us to be. God has called us to make a difference in the world around us. We get to have our lives transformed, but then we're sent out to go share the message to the people that don't know it yet. Breaks my heart whenever we say things like that. You say, well, pastor, you just want a bigger church. Let me just go ahead and break that to pieces right now. Let me tell you why that's so backwards to me. Do you know how much harder my life is because I have a bigger church? You don't think my life would be easier to go sit with 40 people and just every Sunday just speak to the same 40 people? You know how much easier my life would be? I'd be in one church service. I would know everybody's name. People wouldn't be angry at me because I don't shake their hand or get to them quick enough or whatever they want at that given point in time. I could be at all the hospital visits pretty easily. I could be at all their kids' uh, events that they've got going on. We could celebrate birthdays together, and we could have a big Friendsgiving Thanksgiving meal together every single year. It would be so much more convenient for me to do that that way. The problem is I wouldn't be obeying the command of Jesus Christ. That would be the problem with that. Let me tell you how inconvenient it is. I get up at 5.30 in the morning on Sundays with all my kids and I get them ready and they stay from the beginning of that time at 5.30 in the morning going all the way till about 2 p.m. every single Sunday and they don't complain and they do all that. So you think I want a bigger church to make it more complex and more complicated and have more people to manage? You know how hard it is to throw an event for 2,000 people and pivot two days before? Do you know how hard that is? and beg people to bring candy each and every week and beg people to serve and do this, that, and the other? Do you really think that's the easy mentality? And we just are trying to get a bigger church. Now I have to figure out a building plan, a construction plan. I have to figure out how to house more people. I have to figure out how to fundraise for that. Do you, why? Why even do all that? It would be so much easier to go, isn't this pretty good? Joe, look around. Isn't this pretty good? This is pretty good. I like these people. What if we just did this group only? That's so much easier than to do that. But God didn't call us to just be about us. He called us to go be about all the people that don't know him yet. Church cannot remain being all about you. When will church shift? At what year? Is it a year? Is it, is it a month? Is it five years? Some of you have been it since you were little kids. Some of y'all were dedicated on a stage at some point. That's you. So at what point do you go be the light in all the world? Let's do some passage observation. Man, we're preaching today. Number one, prophecy was fulfilled. We read about it. The prophecy was fulfilled. That was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. All the land, those living in the darkness saw a great light. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of, the, of death, a light has dawned. Number three, Jesus taught the people to repent. He said, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Number four, Jesus taught the people, come follow me. Remember what he did? Hey, Simon, hey, Andrew, I see you're fishing. Come, follow me. Jesus taught them to fish for people. He said, we're no longer doing physical fish. I will send you out to fish for people. There are people in the room right now, you're going, I would totally go make a difference. I just don't know how. Well, you just got to come and, and start going. You got to start walking first. You get up from where you're at. You stop doing what you're doing and you come follow Jesus and you go, the Lord will lead me into the next step. I just have to keep walking forward. So many people though, don't know where they're going. So they just stay stuck and they stay stagnant. And Jesus says, I'll, I'll teach you how to, how to fish for people. They responded immediately. They didn't pray on it. They didn't think on it. They just went for it. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. Number seven, Jesus found people. He didn't, he didn't stay in the upper room every day. 
He was just behind the desk every day just studying the Bible and the scriptures and he just never talked to anybody because he was busy studying the word of God. I know so many Christians, man, they've done, they've done probably way more Bible studies than I'll ever do. Let me just say it that, than I'll ever do. And they don't, ever, they don't have anybody they've told about Jesus. They've not baptized anybody. They've never led a small group to actually teach anybody else anything. But man, they've absorbed the Bible. You know these people too. What are we doing? Why know all that information? Joe's a personal trainer. Why get credentialed to be a personal trainer if he isn't going to actually teach somebody actually how to apply the truths of what he knows? That's the whole point of being the personal trainer is to go, let me share my knowledge with you. But most Christians I know, they sit on, let me just keep eating and eating and eating and eating eating into the word. And they don't ever share the fruit with anybody else. Guys, we got to do better. Jesus found people. Going on from there, he found James and John. Come follow me. And immediately they left their boat and their father and they followed him. Here's a little practical application this morning. Found people, find people. Like like when you were lost and you know that you've been found and you go, wow, that Brazilian steakhouse tastes good. You go find other people and you tell them about, hey, we got a lunch appointment tomorrow. You got to come eat at this place. This place is incredible. This is what you do when you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You say, let me tell you about my good God who loved me. I started going to this church. He began to work in my life. I've been growing so much this year, and I want to share that with you. Come sit with me at church next Sunday. We're doing a, an initiative called A Thousand Strong. A Thousand Strong. We want to see a thousand people at Revolution Church. It's a thousand strong. We're better together. I want you to invite someone. You probably saw the sign out there in the middle of the Welcome Center. Um, it's literally in the middle, and people kept bumping into it while we were baptized, and they're like, can we move this sign? I said, nope. That sign is out there to be in your face and in your way. If I could buy 10 more and put them in your way, I'd do 10 more and put them in your way. I'd like it to be a maze in there trying to get your stroller through there. Why? Because this is what we're called to do. On that sign, it says, invite somebody. It's got business cards, resource cards, invite cards. You ought to be spreading that in your school. You ought to be putting that at your workplace. You ought to be inviting people to church with you. People ought to be sitting next to you. Listen, some of you come to church every week, you sit by yourself. How long do you sit by yourself? Get somebody at church. You know somebody. Get them to church. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching, proclaiming, and healing. First thing we need to do is figure out how to teach. And you go, I'm not a teacher. Not yet you're not, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Okay? We do this thing in, in our church called small groups. Now, small groups are the opportunity that as the church reaches more people and gets bigger, the goal is to get bigger. We're we're healthy when we're getting bigger. At the same time, we want to feel smaller. And here's what I know about people. The church won't be too big for you if you do two things. Everybody say two. You need to do two things. The church will not ever feel big for you if you do two things. Number one is you get in a small group. You'll never feel connected if you're not in a small group. And number two, you need to serve on a ministry team. You need to be involved serving other people in the church. Those two things right there, if you did just those two things, I would put a lot of money on it. I'm a betting man. I'd put a lot of money on it. You'd have about 50 people in your life that you know in this church because you did those two things. You serve on a ministry team and you go to a small group. Those two things will make you feel connected. Now, here's the deal. I say that because people complain, well, the church is getting too big. Let me just tell you, the church is not too big. It's not. You're just disconnected. You're not doing those two things. Church isn't too big. Here's how I know it. Because even if the church only had 40 people in it, if you weren't doing those two things, you'd still feel disconnected. And you would feel like 40 is too big for you. 40 is too big if you're not connected. you got to get in a group. Now, here's what I'm looking for. This this semester is going to be a little different. January, we launch our groups, but I'm talking to you in November. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm looking for leaders to step up and lead groups. I have two interest meetings coming up. This Saturday at 10 a.m., we're going to have an interest meeting. And we also have next Sunday after this service, we're going to have an interest meeting. So if you want to lead a small group, if God's kind of knocking on your heart's door, here we sing in these songs, here my Lord, send me. If, if he's saying, hey, you need to lead something or do something, then let me tell you how this will work. I have right now about 32 
different groups that are going to be started that I already know that are going, that people are going to be leading. So I've got a lot of groups going. But I've got about 15 different small group materials that are great curriculums that I'm looking for people to coordinate those groups. It's literally you go in, you might open up in prayer, you pop in the, the DVD, and then the guy's going to lead the whole thing. And then you're just coordinating the questions at the back end of the, the message time. Super easy to run a small group, but I'm looking for more people to run a small group. So if you're interested, 10 a.m. on Saturday or after the third service next Sunday, and bring your ideas to the table. If you got something God's put on your heart, we'd love to make it a small group and invite other people to be a part of it. But that's how we're going to teach. We're also going to proclaim on Sunday mornings at church, and we're going to heal through Sunday, uh, our Saturday prayer services. Saturday prayer at 9 a.m. on Saturdays, you got something going on in your life, you need healing, or if you maybe feel like you're being demonized, you got some demons attacking you, let us deal with that on Saturdays, a Saturday prayer at 9 a.m. The Bible says that he healed them. And here's what I'll say. We can't heal you, but you can be healed in Jesus' name. We can't heal you. People can't heal you, but Jesus can heal you in Jesus' name. Last observation is that large crowds followed Jesus. And I bring that up to say, you better get used to large crowds because our church is going to continue to grow. Beyond our church, when you get to heaven, it's going to be jam-packed up in there. It's going to be a lot of people in heaven, so you might as well get used to it. If you got some racial issues going on, you might get past that too because our, our church, very diverse as a church, and we love it that way. We're so about it, okay? So, like, that's what we want. And by the way, when you get to heaven, Jesus ain't going to be the same color you think he's going to be. So you might as well get past that, Okay? Large crowds followed Jesus. Go the message to come to Jesus and have him transform your life and then send you out to help somebody else. I'm gonna actually go to prayer right now. God, I ask you, Lord, to send us. Would you send us, would you use us, Lord, for a world that needs light? Here we are, God, send us, use us. Send me, God. If nobody else will go, I'll go. Send me. God, let us make a difference in the world around us. I think about people right now that might be sitting in this room that don't have a relationship with God. I want you to know that Jesus loves you today. He loves you so much, gave his life for you, died on a cross, but beyond that, he, he rose back to life. And he said, hey, if you'll follow me, I'll change your whole life. I'll change everything about your life. But you gotta believe that I really did come, that I really did die, and I really did come back to life. And if you'll put your faith in him, he'll change everything, church. I promise you, it's for you. He'll change it. If you wanna ask him to be part of your life, just repeat this prayer after me. I actually have it up on the screen if you wanna look up at me and just say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God, church. If you just prayed that prayer, I want you to pull out your phone, text the word new me with no spaces to the number on the screen. Uh, we wanna thank you for being here today. If you're a first time guest, second time guest, or a one month guest, thanks for being a part. Uh, if you made it to one month, go get your one month guest swag bag up at the Connect desk over here. They'll put this in your hands. Got a t-shirt, some goodies in here for you. But I encourage you to take the Stick Six Challenge. Visit us six times and see if this is the community for you. We think one time is just not enough time to get to know each other. So give us the Stick Six Challenge and see if this is the place for you. Let's say goodbye to our online campus on the count of three. One, two, three. Goodbye.